begin, we're going to ask Brother Ron Carr, if he would, to direct our minds in a word of prayer. All right, so we're looking in the first chapter in a couple of things that we've pointed out to you, in particular with this chart, and uh, back myself up here just a little bit to uh, talk about this. Um, sorry about that, I forgot about that, Carrie. Yeah, what we're trying to do is amplified by because we're in this big auditorium. And so if you make a comment, Ron will come to you and let you make your comment. You just speak into that, and uh, or he'll give you the mic and you can speak into it, or he'll hold it for you while you speak, either way. But we're just so everybody can be heard, okay? So when we look at this text, we see how it's uh, uh, arranged, and this is just sort of the structure of the book. So now we're in that private period in which John is having this conversation. Uh, Jesus hasn't come on the scene yet. He's being asked the three questions, you know, who are you? Um, I can find my notepad here. Oh, right there in front of me. Um, asking who, who are you, then why are you baptizing, and, uh, you know, where's the Messiah? And of course, we talked about that, that uh, how he answers them is pretty interesting in a lot of ways. But anyway, this is one of the private conversations that he has. This, pri this sort of private view that I'm getting here goes all the way through uh, John 2, verse 11, the end of the uh, miracle at Cana. Because really, even at the miracle of Cana, which seems like a public event, it's only the disciples and a few of the people that are working uh, in, in, the, in the wedding uh, that Jesus has a conversation with. So he's not addressing the whole wedding party. So it's still a private sort of thing, and we'll talk about that some more. So let me go on to get down to where we were uh, in this uh, study, which was question number 10, I believe. Is where, yeah, that's where we actually left off. So, you know, they ask, who are you? Can you name three of the Old Testament links and or concepts related to his answers? And, of course, we did that. Isaiah 40, Zechariah, or Malachi, and some, I uh, can't remember the other one right offhand. So, what is, the, what is the significance of the discussion of baptism in verses 24 through 28? Why, why is that significant? You remember what we said about that? Okay, yeah, there's baptism in the Old Testament. Uh, that is certainly true, and that is right. I mean, anybody have anything else? Uh, baptism was a known practice under the Old Testament, uh, which is what Ollie just pointed out. But clearly, John's baptism is different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit because only Jesus could administer that baptism of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism was one of repentance, that's true. That's what we usually say. Somebody will ask me, and I'll say, well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, preparing the hearts of the people to turn to the Messiah when he came. And so then, but also John's baptism was indirectly a means of identifying Jesus. That's how he identified Jesus. Did you ever realize that? Uh, and we'll, we'll see that in just a moment when we read some of the rest of the, the first chapter of John there. But look, uh, let's read, while I mentioned that, let's read verses uh, 29 through uh, 34. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Read that carefully again. Read that really carefully. There's an interesting point here he, he's making. He said, This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. So, I wish I had a chalkboard here, but the illustration would be, so say this is a, or you can just do it yourself, or you put it on your paper here or something, just put a J there for John the Baptist. And John says, then here is one who came before me, an arrow in front of John. And then one's coming after me, so you put an arrow after John. And then he talks about, he ranks higher than me. So put an arrow going up. So you have the pre-existence of Jesus on the one hand before John, he came before. Then you have the exaltation of Jesus in that arrow going up. And then you have the coming of Christ, I think in the second judgment is what he's referring to here or at the end of time as well. He's still coming in that sense. You know, what we refer to, and we mentioned this when we talked about uh, premillennialism three or four months ago, I don't know, maybe it's longer than that. It's pre, you know, you lose track of time, don't you, in this pandemic? Uh, but I remember preaching some lessons on, on uh, premillennialism, and we mentioned this word eschatology, the doctrine of last things. And from a Jewish point of view, I mean, how they viewed history or Jesus, the last dispensation, you know, the last dispensation of time or the last period of time in their mind, began with Jesus. This is all one event. The, de- the birth, the death, and the judgment is all one event in their way of writing things, in their way of viewing things. It's all one event. And so the eschatology, the doctrine of, of the final judgment, the last things and all those, uh, is very much a mentioned, I don't know how many times in, in the Gospel of John, the hour has come. He says it here in John 2 in just a moment to his, to his mother. My hour has not come. Thank you, Lord. And so uh, he, he mentions, I think, I forgot how many times, but I'll have it for you Sunday. Throughout the Gospel of John, you, if you just did a search on your Bible program, last hour or my hour um, has not come, the last hour, I think, uh, you, you would find... 12, 15 references. So John's gospel is very much uh, thinking about God's judgment coming. You know, one I think of uh, John 12, verse 48, when Jesus said, uh, uh, lost, my, lost my mind here. John 12, 48, I know that as well as I know my name. What is my name? Oh, no. Uh, the one who rejects me hath one that judges him, the same word that I've spoken shall judge him in the last day. So again, uh, much of John's gospel looks to and points to that day, that hour, that Jesus' hour has not come. So anyway, it's just an interesting point. We'll talk some more about it on Sunday. Uh, So we go to question number 12. How would you explain verse 29 and verse 31? How is it that in verse 29... John sees Jesus coming and declares, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But then in verse 31 says, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. On the one hand, he sees him coming and says, There's the Lamb of God. And then he says, I didn't know him. How is that possible? This is just a good hermeneutic lesson, the lesson on how to interpret the scriptures. It almost seems contradictory, doesn't it, when you read it? What you have to remember is that that John is just summarizing what he's done. He isn't giving a blow-by-blow chronological events of, of what took place. What we see in this text is the baptism of Jesus had taken place earlier uh, than, than what John is referring to here, John the writer, the gospel writer. John is explaining his work. That's what what he's saying. 
Here's my work. My work is to reveal him, is to make him known. And the truth is, I didn't know him until he was baptized. So why is that? Well, he went on to say, this is he of whom I said, come, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. Uh, 33, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Well, who was going to baptize with the Holy Spirit? John knew that. He knew that the Messiah was going to. That's who he was preparing the way for. So when he came to John to be baptized, uh, and they had that conversation, then John, belief as to who he is is confirmed because he sees the dove descending upon him, uh, or the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And so uh, there is that confirmation for him. him. He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptized with water. And I have seen and have bore witness that this is the Son of God. So again, this is John's purpose. You know, earlier in verses 19 through uh, 23, um, John identifies who he is. He explains who he is and who he's not. And then uh, an interesting, another interesting point ge- geographically here, uh, verse 28, these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now, uh, they think that a lot of people think Jesus was baptized on the Jordanian side of, of the river because of this statement. And it may be. I don't know. I just know that he was baptized in the Jordan River. And uh, so, and there are two, there are two Bethanies. Uh, of course, Bethany, the home of Lazarus and his two sisters. And then there's this Bethany that is further down uh, that Bethany that I just mentioned, Lazarus, is right near Jerusalem. This is up toward uh, the uh, river on the other side, or up toward the river, not where Jerusalem is. As Bethany was near to Jerusalem, this Bethany is near the river Jordan. So that would be, and whether it was on the Israel side or the Transjordanian side, some would argue here, and I, it would be a little bit hard to argue against that, but uh, because I'm not a scholar in the terms of any in any means. So, anyway, um, there's something else I wanted to mention to you here too. Get my notes here. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, so. If we think about then what is being said by John here, the writer John, uh, we see that the function of John the Baptist as a witness was bearing witness to who Jesus is. Then we find the next day, in beginning verse 35, and I'll read through verse 42. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are, you, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now, that's always an interesting thing when there are name changes in the Bible. It signifies a, a new relationship of some sort. You think about who Jacob changing his name to Israel, certainly a change in the relationship between him and God, Abraham to Abram, 
uh, would signify the fact that uh, God's promise, that relationship was changing. Um, you think about Saul and Paul of Tarsus. Um, certainly, clearly a change there. So it generally always signifies a change of, of relationship of some sort. I'm not exactly sure at this point what the change would have been with Peter. Uh, maybe he was very, you know, he was a fisherman. Let's just say that. He was probably rough, rugged, and hewn, and subject to a lot of bad behavior. I don't know. But uh, anyway, and there's more to Peter being to this situation. Uh, Luke 5, verse 1 through 11 is a good text to to look at Peter and, and as he's being called by Jesus, and he, he emphasizes his recognition, recognition of who Jesus is, though he's called Simon in that text. That's when Jesus was told him to let their net down on the other side uh, for a catch. Peter said, well, we fished all night, didn't catch anything, Master. And so, But he said, nevertheless, it's your will. So it may have been Peter yielding his way his his will to somebody else that indicates a change I, I'm, I don't know but anyway as we look at this text one of the interesting things about this text is to see the number of names that are being used by the disciples to refer to to Jesus and it's interesting we have I say seven probably maybe more we could add to that uh, one or two more that may be anybody uh, have What's the first title or description of Jesus that we come to here? Lamb of God. That's exactly right. Now, the, and we've, this isn't the first time. This is actually what, the, at least the second time that we've come to this point about the Lamb of God. I think a clear reference, no doubt, to uh, you know the whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament. The, Isaiah 53 in particular, I think it, it, it's that picture that he's giving us with that title, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. So uh, Isaiah 53 would make that point, and then, of course, the whole sacrificial system would make that point. Remember, remember this while we're reading and studying the Gospel of John. He's writing mainly to Jews. However, he does not leave the Greeks out. There's a couple places that are worthy to know. You know, one of them is the one we just, is, is in the word Lagos. Word. Jesus was the Word, the Word was with God, so on and so forth. Um, that had very special meaning to the Greeks. And it meant uh, the, the term actually meant uh, mediation by principle. Think about who Jesus was if, if you apply it from a Greek standpoint. Now, the Jews had another idea about it, and so did uh, the Romans and that sort of thing. But what is the one thing that, that, the old, that the Hebrews tells us? That Jesus is become a mediator, you see. He's the Word. Uh, in the Old Testament, the word for logos was more of wisdom and of a uh, personification. Proverbs. Wisdom calleth into the streets. You know, those, those statements. Where wisdom is personified as somebody calling out. Um, so you have just that sort of term. And so the, the point of mentioning that to you about uh, the word in, in, in this case is to remind us that this word is eternal, that this word is God, and that we uh, look to him for a better revelation because that's what he came for, to make known the Father, a better revelation. Uh, and, and this, what's it, what I'm really pointing out here is all the connections that you have to Hebrews, to the Gospel of John. A better mediator, a better revelation. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the law in one sense, but he came and revealed to us God. He came and revealed to us grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Grace upon grace. And so what a wonderful thought that is. Uh, well, I was going to let you answer that. But you saw it. So rabbis is another one. Verse 40, 38 and verse 49, twice that's used. There's a, isn't, isn't it interesting when John says, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins, and then there's two of the disciples standing there 
And they start kind of, hmm, interesting. Let me follow him a little bit. And Jesus realizes they're following him. And he turns and says to them, what are you following? What do you want? To me, it's, it's sort of humorous in the sense that the only thing that they can think of to say at that point is, uh, where are you staying? Where are you staying? It's, it's kind of like uh, one of my favorite, I tell this on myself, one of my favorite country music artists years ago was Ricky Skaggs. I, I went and he, he married a girl from Wichita Falls when we, while that was from Wichita Falls, and her whole family still lived there. Uh, Buck White, and their, they were big into country western back then. It's not country western anymore. But anyway, I went to, uh, Ricky lived, uh, had a son, a young son, teenager, 20 or so, that lived in a little suburb of, of Lexington. And we were living in Lexington at the time. And we were eating dinner, and I looked up, and I told Judy, I said, uh, that's Ricky's cat. She looked over, she said, yeah, it sure is. Well, he was eating dinner with his daughter and his son, and I, I really hated to interrupt him, in a way, and, and I was nervous about it to begin with. And So as I walked to the table, I said, uh, I, I, uh, you, you're, you're, I, I'm Bill Robbins. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Ricky Skaggs. And he just kind of laughed. And I said, well, I said, I just wanted you to know that uh, I really appreciate your music and I, I appreciate the fact that, um, that I got to hear you on a Sunday in Wichita Falls, Texas, on a Sunday night, and you told them to wait to have the, the uh, concert until after 8 o'clock so everybody could go to church on Sunday night. And I, I thought that was pretty impressive. That he, that he, and he was only one show that night, and so he just told them 8 o'clock. And uh, at the Red River Opry, and I got to hear him, and man, was it a great performance. Uh, they sang lots of songs because they were in front of family and everything else. So anyway, when you think about them saying to him, where are you going? It's kind of like they're nervous. What are we going to say? And so Jesus said, well, come see where I'm going. And um, where are you staying? And, and he said, come and you will see. A part of that is probably in some ways to say, where are you from? You know, to come and see. I mean, they thought wherever you're staying is where you're from and that sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, we might say that's like, where are you staying, where do you live? That may be something similar to what they're really saying. may not be as uh, nervous as I, I think it is. Uh, so they come across and refer to him as rabbi. What is, this, what is the other uh, one that they use? Lamb of God, Rabbi? Huh? Messiah, okay. Which is to mean the Christ. And the Messiah, the Christ, means the anointed of God. He was God's anointed one from the Old Testament. And then, what's another one? The, the prophet, verse 45. Um, Philip found Nathaniel said to him, We have found him of whom Moses... In the law, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so, in that, um, the one that, Mo that Moses talked about is Deuteronomy 18. When Moses said to the children of Israel, God's going to raise up a prophet like unto me, and to him shall you hearken in all things. And so, it's quoted in Acts 3 as well. And so that he is the prophet, the prophet. And when you see the prophet, he's referring to that prophet of Deuteronomy 18. And you'll not, this isn't the only place you'll see the prophet, but uh, that's what it's referring to, that he's the one that Moses spoke of. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Uh, son of Joseph could well be another name to indicate uh, his, the fact that he's a Jew, the fact that he comes of uh, a pure lineage. But I have king of Israel in verse 49. Uh, Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And then the son of God in verse 49. Um, and I think that's the son of man in verse 51. Yeah, that's seven. So those are all terms used to designate Jesus that we're going to find used throughout 
uh, the Gospel of John, I will tell you that the Son of Man is, is more frequently used by Matthew to describe Jesus, in part to talk about uh, Daniel 7, the coming of the kingdom, and so forth. Yes. Why wouldn't he use word? Uh, because the function of word was not... I mean, you could have said word. I mean, you and I would say that. But they just didn't make that connection, the word. They just did not. And it was more of a role, or a, I shouldn't say that, because those are roles. Uh, it was more of his work, his function, to reveal. Word would reveal, and that sort of thing. Okay, so... Thinking about that then a little bit more, uh, we come to read this next section, uh, beginning at verse 43. Let me get my book in the right place here. It's actually, this is our last question, isn't it? But this is a great place to talk about because I could, we can talk a lot about this uh, relative to the things that we've already said. And then I'll go back quickly and review what we've talked about in John 1 in preparation for chapter 2 on Sunday. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Anybody have any idea what that means? Why, why does he ask that question? You're on the right track. You're on the right track. Uh, Nazareth was a backwater town. It was a small town. No prophets had ever come from there. And so just because no prophet had ever come from there, they said, what can possibly come out of Nazareth? Or can anything good come out of Nazareth? Is, is sometimes stated by the other gospel writers. You know? And so it's sort of always a humorous thing when you think about who Jesus is to say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Or can a prophet come out of Nazareth? Well, Jesus is God. He can come from anywhere he wants to, you know? And so it's kind of, and of course he doesn't mean any disrespect by it. He just, he's, but, but you know, in a way, what it serves to tell us sometimes is how we get so ingrained in, in an idea that something has never happened in Nazareth, so therefore it could never happen. And that's just sometimes the way we think, isn't it? That, that after all these years we've seen this and this and this come there, 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 but never here or never there. And so we think, well, that can't be. Well, we're trying to put God in a box then if we're not careful. And so we get ourselves into trouble. Uh, so let me co continue to read this. Verse 46, Daniel said, uh, Nathaniel said, to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And um, Philip said to him, well, come and see. I mean, remember, these people are talking to each other like we would talk to each other. You know, you go and you're excited because we found him whom the prophet Moses talked about, whom Moses talked about the prophet, and then, you know, Nathaniel said, oh yeah, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth, really, seriously, out of that backwater town, that, you know, what comes out of it? I've never seen anybody. And, and you know what's interesting, how we do it in our society today, um, you go to Hope, Arkansas, I mean, nobody knew about Hope, Arkansas very, very much prior to Bill Clinton, but they have huge signs coming in from the city everywhere, the home of Bill Clinton. Uh, they have it in every place like that for people that are well-known or famous. Otherwise, you wouldn't know the town. Or they have famous athletes named and said, you know, this is the home of so-and-so. So, you know, uh, you would know those cities if it weren't for... I mean, who would know of... Tupelo, Mississippi. Born for Elvis, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You wouldn't know of it except somebody like him. So, 
Anyway, uh, so Jesus saw Nathanael coming, and I love this. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit or guile. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I mean, Nathanael was blown away by that. He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. I mean, that's a pretty full, firm affirmation for, by one of his disciples. So what is it that has caught Nathanael, this one who said, can anything good come out of Nazareth, to just automatically turn on his heels totally the other way and say, you are king of Israel, you're the son of God. And, and what is impregnated in that term king of Israel, you're the Davidic king. You're the heir to the promise that God made to David. Remember God, Jesus says to him, you are an Israelite in whom there is no God. He's recognizing that Nathaniel is a very devout Jew. He knows the book. He knows the law. He's recognizing that. And it's obvious by his answer that he does. And so he says, you're the son of God. The one that was promised in the Old Testament. So he's, and so then Jesus answered and said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly. And 25 times in the Gospel of John is that phrase used, truly, truly. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What story is that? Yeah, Jacob's ladder. I'm of the opinion that when Jesus said, I saw you sitting under the fig tree, and he begins by saying, here's an Israelite in whom there is no guile, uh, and he saw him sitting under the fig tree, he was meditating on that story of Jacob and his ladder. An Israelite in whom there is no guile, that was, Jacob was not an Israelite in whom there was no, uh, no guile or deceit. He was a trickster from the word go. I mean, he took his birthright from his brother. He stole his firstborn blessing, deceived his father until he met Uncle Laban, and then he got his, he got his comeuppance, didn't he, uh, through that. But here is a guy, and so he says of Nathaniel, Here, you, you are an Israelite in whom there is no guile. There's no, there's no hidden agenda with you. There's no deceit in you. I mean, he really, he, he tells us who Nathaniel is, what kind of person he is. He's a man that everybody trusted. He was a man that his word was his bond. He was a man that when he said he would do something, he did it. I mean, that's what all that means, in whom there is no guile. And so it, it seems to me, uh, then when he ties that in at the end, you know, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, what is, what is, what is he telling us? Yeah, thank you. Very good. He's, the latter is the mediator between heaven and earth. And Jesus says, uh, you know, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto the Father except by me. I, I'm the mediator. I'm the principal mediator by which you get to God. So this is a great Old Testament text that is how the Old Testament is being used in the New Testament to see uh, the, the fact of who Jesus is. And Nathaniel recognizes it immediately. You're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. I mean, that's powerful to me. Uh, you know, I, when, when I think about teaching people and, and people being converted to the Lord. There's just so much evidence in John for them to see and to understand who Jesus is. Any comments or questions over anything? I've got five minutes according to that clock. If I don't have my watch on. I did not hear the answer. Which one of the Pardon me?
mediator. Ron said mediator. Uh, and that's what he was. He was the latter. He was the mediator between heaven and earth. I don't think Gary answered that question, did you? Yeah, Ron did. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I asked what story it is, and then you said Jacob's Ladder, and then I said, what do you think the significance of that is? And you said the ladder, yeah. Okay. So, we got uh, five minutes here. You got any comments or questions they want to ask? All right, let me just review for you about three minutes, five minutes here, see if I can do this. In John, the, the first chapter, we have Jesus as the beginning, or in the beginning, rather. Uh, and anything that's in the beginning means it was there before the beginning. Uh, think about it. It doesn't, take, you know, it doesn't take much to realize that. But in the beginning was the Word. You, you couldn't have been there before unless you'd been there. You couldn't have been in the beginning unless you'd been there before the beginning. Okay? And so that's pretty much the point. And then he talked about John coming in who was going to bear witness to him. Uh, I thought it was interesting that uh, what he says about John in this, really that the true light, which gives light to everyone, verse 9, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him. And so uh, John was more or less what we would say the lamp, and Jesus was the flame. He went before announcing Jesus. This was his work, was to make known. And he wasn't the light, but he, he was the lamp. And uh, Jesus came to his own, and they didn't receive him. You know, receiving Jesus Christ is, is, is a biblical concept. We sometimes want to discount it because you say, well, receive Jesus as your personal Savior. No, that's not, what he's, that's not what he's saying here. But receiving Jesus is a biblical concept, but you have to receive him well. Listen to what he says. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed, past tense, or was in the act of believing in him. That's how you received him. And it's not static, it's not passive. You continue to act. Then it says he gave the right to become. He didn't say they were children of God. He just said they, because they believed and believing and receiving, I'll tell you basically the same thing. And so they, they, didn't, they weren't the children of God. Now three things real quick in John 14 through 18. In verse 14, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father. He is the model of God's glory. That's what he's telling us. He's the model of God's glory because he is God. And then in verse 16 and 17, um, and what John, John, verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. There's that statement again uh, that we find three different times I think it's mentioned. Verse 16 and 17, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He's the model of God's glory and he is the minister of God's grace. That's what his point is here. And then uh, verse, eight, verse 18, uh, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Let me see if I can word this right. The life of Jesus, and what I need to tell you, well, I'll, let me say this statement. The life of Jesus is the exegesis of the Father. Now, the word exegesis is the word that we mean when we study a passage and we learn what it says because we've exegeted the passage. Now, why do I say it that way? Because what he says here in verse 18, he has made him known. He has exegeted God. To us. He's made him known to us. That's what we're doing when we take a passage of scripture and we study it, then we're making it known. And so that's what he's saying. He is the exegesis of the Father. It, it is such a beautiful and uh, dynamic uh, chapter. And then, of course, you have the discussion with John the Baptist, who, who is giving his testimony to him and so forth, in which we've already covered that tonight. But I just wanted to give you that again. So chapter 2, 
on Sunday. There's a lot of interesting, fascinating things there as well to learn that uh, we sometimes overlook, and uh, especially as it relates to the Old Testament. So that's where we'll be on Wednesday night. I mean, on Sunday morning. All right, I think Brother Birch will have a few announcements to make. Well, he'll make it. Because of our Zoom, uh, the only reason we have to do it, and you don't have to say it, but I know you don't know what it is, is so that they'll have you next time. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you here in the class. Good to see you who are Zooming with us online. Just a great time to get together in the middle of the week to study the Bible. One of our members always says it's halftime. And it's a really good time to get together. We'll make uh, a couple of announcements before we'll have our closing prayer. And then uh, after you've left uh, the online streaming, we'll have a few more announcements for us. One really exciting thing We've talked about uh, Bible Correspondence Courses. We've had continuing for several months now a, a new effort to spread those far and wide. And uh, a few months ago, we had one lady, probably an inmate from a jail in Tennessee, who gave us eight names and uh, started the Bible Correspondence Course. And uh, those eight gave five or six more and every time we have added people, they have added more. We actually have 57 people in that one jail. I don't have any idea how big the jail is. 57 people in that jail that are doing Bible correspondence. Well, the exciting thing is that we've just reached the point where two of those students have reached the last of the seven studies. One of those has asked for baptism. The other one very likely will. So I've contacted uh, Ben May, who uh, lives in that area, and hopefully he'll be able to make contact and, and find a way to teach those if they have more questions and to baptize them. So that's the way it works. That came from our internet initially, but uh, think about it, if all of us were able to make contact with someone that we know Every day we uh, get things on the internet and we pass that on to friends here far and wide. It'd be very easy to do Bill's Two Minute with Bill Robinson, which has a link that takes them to a request for a Bible study. Spread that thing around, share it with your friends and see what will happen. But that's the uh, really exciting news. Let's have a closing prayer and I will give you a few of the local announcements. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this time we can be together. In these difficult times, we pray, Father, you continue to strengthen us and to keep us safe from the virus. Help us, Father, to have the courage to spread the gospel to those that we know. Forgive us, Father, when we fall short of what you'd have us to be. Go with us through this night and with our loved ones. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And if we're disconnected from streaming,